Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. So like I said in our intro today, we have Taylor Hunt and I am excited to have him here today. So Taylor, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on the show. I appreciate uh, you thinking of me. You bet. You know, when your name first came across the table about possible guests, I was interested instantly by your story and that journey from addiction into this really incredible yoga practice that you've developed. Why don't you start wherever you're comfortable? Tell us about that journey. Oh, man, it's a loaded question. Um, yeah. So my journey with uh, yoga really started with me getting sober. I was about six months sober. And um, I was working the 12 steps of recovery. And um, I got to the 11th step. And the 11th step is, you know, just paraphrase, like sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God. And, um, you know, just like if you know anything about the steps, like what you're trying to do is basically integrate these one line, one sentence into your daily living. That's what I was trying to do. And at the time, um, I had prayer like taken care of. Um, I've always been a person that has been, you know, somewhat devoted, um, even though I felt like I walked away from God during my addiction. But I didn't know what meditation was. And so my sponsor came to me and he said, um, as we're working this stuff, and he's like, well, why don't you pray for a little bit of guidance with uh, like for meditation? And I was like, done. I'll do it. I'll get on my knees. I'll say a prayer. I'll do some, you know, you know, thoughts and contemplations of, you know, like what that would mean for me and what that would look like. And, um, literally maybe a day later after I started saying the prayers, uh, this lady walked into my life and, um, I was at a meeting, 12 step meeting. And after the meeting, she walked directly up to me and she said, I think I'm supposed to teach you yoga. And um, literally, and I was like, I don't know who told you that, but you're out of your mind. (laughs) Girls and I'm not interested in it. That's like literally what I said. Six months sober. That's where I was at at the time, you know, and in in 2005, 2006, that's I mean, yoga was not cool for for men. That's for sure. Uh, But my I I immediately felt like my masculinity, like getting checked. Uh, You know, the first time she asked me, I was like, that's not that's not happening. Like I'm not in, I'm not into it. So, um, you know, but I also think that like my, my higher power has like a sense of humor. And so over the next couple of days, like what was interesting is, is that I saw this lady six different times. She asked me the same things. I saw her at random places, saw her at a grocery store, saw her walking down the street, saw her at another meeting. I saw her pumping her gas. Um, each time she'd ask me the exact same thing. She's like, oh, this is so weird. I keep seeing you everywhere. Like, I think I'm supposed to teach you yoga. You want to do my yoga class? And the last time, the sixth time, I was like, okay, I'll go to your class. You know, I was kind of freaked out that she was like stalking me or something like, you know, that she was like, it was, it was awkward uh, to see that, you know, see the person six times. And so I, uh, I like resigned to the fact that, you know, like I was just, I was just going to do it. And so I talked to my sponsor, told him what I, I signed up for, and I was told him I was a little weary about it. And he said, uh, I, he said something that really, I think, changed my life. And because it brought me face to face that there was like some sort of bigger thing happening here. And the bigger thing for me was that uh, there was something else at play, like with my higher power. Uh, I was being looked after and I was being given what I was needed. And that was really cool. And he said, you know, isn't yoga meditation? And I remember like saying out loud, I cannot believe that I wasn't paying attention to this. Like, why didn't I say yes the first time? And I went to my first yoga class. And I, before I went, I went to the supermarket and I bought a terrible mat. And I had, I had no money, no nothing. I had long basketball shorts on. And I drug myself to the yoga class. And it was all women. Uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I, but it definitely like feel, I felt threatening and vulnerable for me as being a male. And so uh, I didn't know what to expect. And I, I sat in that room and I was just like dreading it. I was nervous and anxious. <laughs> it was it was terrible. And then all of the women were like doing these little stretches. We were doing these stretches and I started doing them too. And I was like, is this what yoga is? You know, like, I, and I, it was just a hot mess. And so we went through the practice. It was Ashtanga yoga. And so I've never done a different style. 
And uh, I went through it and I hated it. I absolutely, it was terrifying and I hated it. And it was the first day that I ever saw the consequences of my actions of putting drugs and alcohol and needles in my arms. It was the first time. Like I saw it crystal clear and it was brutal. And, uh, you know, I'd spent 15 years, I, I, I guess maybe 12 years out there drinking and using and really partying hard. It was, it was one of those things that I was in that class and I just kept on getting angry and angry with how I treated myself. Mm-hmm. I laid down and I was never going to come back. And I literally got up out of the yoga of Shavasana. I got out of Shavasana and I literally walked over uh, to the lady and I said, I'm never going to see you again. Walked out in the parking lot and smoked the cigarette and drank a Red Bull. And, uh, and I was like, I'm never coming back to yoga again because I felt vulnerable and it felt, I mean, it made me feel crazy. My sponsor talked me, talked me into coming back. Uh, thank God. Yeah. He, he talked me, uh, into coming back. And, uh, he said another thing that would change my life. He said, you know, most of the time, like sponsors and stuff like that would say like, you know, if you're not going to go to, go to meetings and you're not going to read the big book, you're not going to do a program of recovery. Like you're not going to be able to stay sober. Well, my sponsor said, like, if you're not going to do all of that stuff and also practice yoga because it looks like you're supposed to do yoga, I don't know if you're going to stay sober, Taylor. And man, that hit like a ton of bricks. And I went back the next time, you know, I was less nervous, had the same crappy mat, the same one pair of shorts that I had. And uh, I I went through the same exact practice. We know the Shtanga Yoga, like it's the same practice every single day. And I, I did, did it. I couldn't really do it. I couldn't touch my toes. Couldn't do any of that kind of stuff. It was somewhat humiliating the first and second time, just like how physically demanding it was and how out of shape and how, how much damage I had done to my body. And I, um, I laid down and it was the first time in my life. And, and this is just telling me straight up. This is the, it was the first time in my life that I got done with that practice and it was the first time that I'd ever felt some sort of compassion and love towards myself. Mm-hmm. First time ever. And I, uh, I remember thinking that the grass is green on my side of the street. And I never thought that my life and, and actually in my entire life that, that the grass was green on my side of the street. I always looked at other people, compared myself. I wanted to be them. I didn't want to be me. I wanted the, what they had. I didn't want what I had. And then that day, I wanted what I had. And uh, that's a big psychic change. That's a big psychological change for sure. And uh, the next thing that happened to me is I was crying just because of the overall experience. And I'm not necessarily a crier. And I sat there. And most of the time, I say like a little bird like whispered in my ear. But it was like, I mean, I'll just sound crazy. It's fine. Like, it was like God like spoke into my ear and it said, you're perfect just the way you are. And when that happened to me, I literally like sobbed like a baby. And I felt like I let go of like 500 pounds of garbage that I was holding onto my back. And I rolled over and this lady is like witnessing this whole thing. I, I rolled over, I looked at her and I said, how do I do this every day? And she said, come with me. I'll teach you. I'll teach you how to do it every day. And literally, I have not stopped since that day. Uh, and it's, it, it's been a remarkable journey. Uh, remarkable. Definitely hard to have that much dis- discipline and to work through all of the trauma and uh, kind of abuse and things that I did to myself and what other people did to me and what I did to other people and work through all of that. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade any of the stuff that happened in my past to be in this moment right here with you. And thank you so much for sharing that. It's a, a really incredible story. Now, what's interesting to me is um, the sense of architected looseness to the story. Like, you know, it's like it felt like there was like a hand pushing in a direction, but it also wasn't like some totally laid out path. Like you had free will, you had choices to make. What about your road to recovery? Was it a thousand little things that pushed you there? Or was there one or two big events that got you ready to make the leap into living sober? Good question. Everyone asked me this, and I think it was a couple big things. It wasn't small things. Because if it was really left up to me, like I would probably still be drinking and using uh, because it was comfortable to me and I was okay with like dying or at least the thought of dying. And so, you know, the big thing that really helped me was that uh, I had an overdose 
gave me a, like a moment of clarity or you know, like several moments of clarity. Um, I also had a DUI, gave me a moment of clarity as well. And these happened like, you know, years apart, but they were still sort of my coming to, you know, believe that I had this disease. And, um, and then the last thing is that uh, my ex-wife, she set up a room for me at a treatment center. And I got high the day before because I knew this date was coming. And uh, she packed my stuff. I didn't have much. Uh, she was mad at me, obviously, just because I wasn't being the person I needed to be. And so uh, she put me in the car and she drove me to the hospital treatment center. And uh, the, the white coats came and they picked me up. They drug me out of the car and strapped me down to the bed. And that was like them doing for me what I could not have done for myself. And that was a major moment of surrender. Uh, I, I fought it, of course, you know, um, but eventually like when you're in a five point restraint, you know, like you really you can't get out. Like uh, the what they show in movies is not true. Uh, you know, like you can't get out of it, or at least I couldn't get out of it. And I, uh, I sat there for three days and withdrew from heroin. You know, and I'd used heroin for about two years uh, up to that point and like putting, you know, about 30 sticks a day, you know, 30 needles a day in, in my arms. And uh, I withdrew hard and took three days to um, to, to withdraw me. And uh, I sh- sat there and I shook, uh, we call it riding the cot. I rode the cot for, for three days and, and I basically went through flu-like symptoms and it felt like my bones were breaking. And uh, I never want to forget it. The remarkable thing is when it got when I got done with that and I started actually feeling a little bit better, they actually let me go down to the, the cafeteria to get food. And, and immediately, as soon as I ate food, I had sort of like another spiritual awakening uh, is what I would call it. I remember eating the food and it was like the first time that I'd been nourished for a really long time. You don't realize how important food is until you are basically starving yourself because you don't need to eat, you know, anesthetizing yourself. And so... Um, I ate and then I walked up to my bed and I started crying again. And uh, I got on my knees and I said, God, if, if you can get me out of this one, I'm willing to do whatever it takes in order to get sober. I like, I will do anything that it takes. And, and um, Ram, I, I went and laid down in my bed and it was the first time in probably 10 years that I got eight hours of sleep. I woke up in the morning and I literally woke up and I said, I want to live again. I literally said that as soon as I woke up. And it was just, it was sort of this, these events of my wife, my ex-wife, like having me strapped down, like me being by myself, like me eating, you know, like understanding the consequence of my actions. And then all of a sudden it was like, boom, it came full. And I was like, I want to live. It came full circle. And I was like, I want to live again. Yeah. Earlier you'd mentioned I was okay with dying or at least the thought of dying and that distinction. Can you tell us about that? Well, I mean, I think that I, I think that when you're living in the disease and the type of lifestyle that I was having, that the thought that I'm not going to make it much longer is like really prevalent. You know, it's like it's yeah. right there. You know, I think that if I was if I was dying and I was on my deathbed, I would have had a million regrets. Uh, just because like I knew that I wasn't supposed to be living my life like that. That's, um, you know, so in my head, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to make it out of this 27 year old club or I'm going to die before 27. I'm going to be part of that club. And then on the other side, like I was going to have so many regrets if I did have that. And so, like, I don't know if that's a coping mechanism or what it, whatever it is, but I thought for sure that I wasn't going to make it. And I sort of had this thought that it was like, I'm OK with not being here. Uh, because really I was suffering, you know, like I was suffering a lot. You know, I, I think that my family was wondering what was happening to me. And I was in the process of like figuring out who I was and, and I was suffering and I didn't want to suffer anymore, you know? And so like, there was a part of me that would have been okay with me like going. Uh, but then there would have been another part that had a bunch of regrets because that's not how I was supposed to live my life. Yeah. So the thought of death was something that you had peace with, but actual dying probably would have been something different. Yeah. Well, I mean, I also, when I, when I overdosed, uh, I was basically dead for four minutes and they revived me. They put a defibrillator on and restarted my heart. And 
pump me full of Narcan. You know, I remember like people asking me like, ah, oh, did you see the, did you see the light? You know, did you see the light? And I, was, and, and I, I literally would say like, no, I didn't see the light. I actually saw the darkness and it scared the shit out of me. I didn't see the light. Like there wasn't someone there, like, you know, there wasn't angel around me, like, you know, saying you're, you're going to be okay kind of thing. It was like, no, there's, this is actually the void. And that, that was scary to me too. Um, but still I was suffering and I, I, you know, and one thought I was okay with it. It was like, I didn't want to suffer anymore, but the other thought was like, there's so much more life. I, I was 25 and I'm 40 now, yeah. you know? It's like, well, let's, let's flip it though. So when you woke up that morning after getting that great sleep and you're like, actually, I want to be alive. Was there ever a point where you realized it's like the difference between the idea of wanting to be alive and actually living and making peace with the latter rather than being in love with the former? Wow. You know, I haven't given that much thought, but I, I do know that, uh, man, that's a really good question. Ask me again. Ask me that again. All right. So um, I'm not sure if, if you'd known this about me prior to our conversation, but my background is as an addiction therapist. And, okay. and uh, I'm, you know, long, long history of recovery myself. Maybe the recovery part. I didn't know the therapy part. One of the things that I have experienced and I believe other people have experienced is that idea of like wanting to die and the, that sense of like death, but then the reality of death versus the fantasy of death. Thinking about death and the probability of death being an escape mechanism from the grimness of your reality. It puts a temporary timestamp on your reality. It helps you psychologically cope with your reality that you're going to die soon. So this is fine. Versus the reality of death where you're like, damn, I'm going to die. And that being a sharp turning point for people going into recovery and like actually bottoming out and trying to get sober. But then that like what I kind of call recovery zombies where you get into like recovery and you're like, life is amazing. And then you're like, Oh no, like I still have to pay taxes and like people are going to break up with me and like things can get boring and like, you know, like whatever crappy thing. And that difference between like being in love with the fantasy of living versus like the reality of living. And was there ever a transition point from you when you got sober and especially when you got in, into yoga and, and like you went from the like fantasy of sobriety or the fantasy of living and being in love with living to living in peace or making peace with life? Yeah, I mean, I do know that in my recovery, uh, there was about a year period or maybe a two year period where I had sort of like this fantasy of like that everything is going to be amazing. And it took a lot of realness in order to sort of like combat the, you know, the fact that, you know, life was still going to happen. You know, there's been plenty of tragedies in sobriety, but I would take sobriety over, you know, drugs and alcohol ever. Uh, I would take it over every single time. You know, because also like it's given me an opportunity to, you know, like I hate this term, but like to be awake, you know, like to look at life like I'm awake instead of asleep. And I was like putting myself to sleep on a continual basis, especially with heroin. There was definitely like this sort of like coming, you know, to reality. And I think that's also the good part about yoga, too, is that yoga like brought me face to face with like the consequences of my actions, childhood trauma. It brought me, you know, all of a sudden like. You know, where I think a lot of people in recovery like can glaze over those things. You know, they won't talk about them until like 15 years later, once they're, you know, 15 years sober or something like that. And, you know, things start coming out this, uh, sideways where like, you know, I had to sort of take life by the, take it by the reins. And all of a sudden, like I had to deal with that stuff immediately because like it was being brought up on my yoga mat. There was definitely this fantasy, but I think that what yoga does, and I think that one of the benefits of like what I experienced is that there's sort of this tearing down of fiction, you know, there's this tearing down of like, I'm not that anymore, you know, and discarding it. And I'm not that either. And I'm not this thing that I tell myself, and I'm not a piece of crap. And things are going to be amazing, but they're also going to be terrible too, you know, and, and living life on, you know, what I would say, life, life on life's terms. That's kind of one of the most amazing things I think about, you know, like being in 12 steps and also being in yoga too. I totally relate to what you're talking about. Now, a thing that I find very interesting around your story very particularly is how you get into it, you're doing this stuff. And at one point, you're able to take this thing that's been so therapeutic for you and turn it into something that you actually do as your sole focus, as your sole professional focus, therapeutic focus. You've really been able to do some incredible things. How did you avoid taking any addictive steps? around your practice though. So just taking your addiction from being drugs and alcohol to being this new thing that you're doing. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, to be quite honest, I think that maybe in the beginning that there was a switch of addictions, like sort of this adrenaline high um, or this like endorphin release thing that uh, had to occur, like in order for me to feel good or something like that. And I was kind of searching that. But I think that for the most part, those feelings like end and then you're met with reality again. <laughs> You know, and, and it's great because like in the meantime, when, when during those addictive like years of my yoga, I was able to establish discipline. That's great. You know, like you establish discipline, like, you know, there's some sort of restriction, but like you gain some internal benefits and health and all of these different things. Because, I mean, it's not really the same thing. Addiction, you know, and yoga, you can do it addictively, but it's still a healthy thing. There's like a little bit of play there. But there was like this, you know, a moment where I realized that I was practicing six days a week and really rigid about it and how I thought about it. And like, you know, the restricting of my diet and the restricting of like my lifestyle and wouldn't go on vacations and wouldn't take days off and wouldn't do all of these things. And what I realized, you know, and this is this has happened several times where I'm like, you know, yoga is my life, but it's supposed to give me a better life. It's not supposed to be my sole focus. It's supposed to make my heart be open and it's supposed to make my mind be open. And it's not supposed to make me more rigid. You know, it's not supposed to make me a fundamentalist. You know, it's not supposed to make me like want to get every single person to practice yoga the way that I do. And so, I mean, in the beginning, of course, you know, it was addictive. It was like, you know, there's like this endorphin thing. But like you have these moments of, of clarity, these moments of like peace and you're like, yeah, I'm going to do this practice because like it helps me like be devout. It helps me like get determined and like be ambitious about like, you know, wanting to get things done. Uh, but it also helps me like get really clear with like what my focus is and what my purpose is. Eventually, like it switched, it switched off of that for me. I don't know if it does it for everyone, but I feel pretty fortunate that it, that it did because I think that most people, if they stayed in the spot that I was in the beginning, that they would pretty much like wreck themselves. You know, they wouldn't be able to stick around yoga yeah, because it'd be tearing them down all the time. Yeah. Would you mind if I, if I shared two thoughts on that? Sure. I feel like people very often look at addiction as being this kind of like undisciplined thing when I actually feel like addicts are some of the most disciplined people I've ever met in my life. It's just that they have like a very specific focus of their, of their discipline. It's about like getting high, getting drunk and like whatever it takes to make that stuff happen. It's incredibly, this incredibly disciplined thing. If you can tap into that discipline and do it in a healthy way, like do, take it into a healthy pursuit. That's great. Like, that's fantastic. And it's, it, you can still have like addictive patterns around healthy things. The second thing I wanted to add is that like people with like addictive tendencies can often take something that's good for you and figure out ways to hurt themselves with it still. Right. So it's like that it's the addictive tendency of whether it's drugs or whether it's like running or music or buying things or booze or whatever it is. It's that figuring out how to hurt ourselves. What I love about your story is that transition point where it was like, there was this thing that was killing me. And I was able to let go of that. And then I was able to invest in something that was saving me and helping me and helping me process my trauma. But at some point I was able to do that in a way that wasn't so rigid. And for me, that's like kind of a transition point from addiction to living. And I don't want to put that on you that that's just what I'm hearing as I'm hearing part of your story. No, I mean, that's exactly what happened to Like, There's moments where all of a sudden it was like, this is like feeding my soul. It's not addictive anymore. It's not like after something. I'm not after a posture. I'm not after a new series. I'm not after like this adrenaline rush or this endorphin release. I'm literally after just like processing of whatever is coming up. You know, I think most of the time my practice is like about putting things in places where they need to go. Yeah, man. I love that so much. I love that so much. So at what point for you, does it transition from being something that's physically therapeutic, like mentally, like spiritually therapeutic into becoming something that you're able to turn your passion into your profession? Well, I mean, I started teaching when I was maybe a year and a half, two years into just, you know, starting the practice. I was just really a baby, you know, like, uh, I mean, that's really young to start teaching. I think it happens pretty young for most people nowadays, just because of teacher training and things like that. But it happened really fast. And um, the thing that really turned me on to it is, you know, I did a teacher training and I, I did all of the stuff, but I spoke differently than everyone else in the teacher training. And I remember like, I was like, who am I going to teach? I was like, who am I going to teach? Like, I'm not the typical yoga teacher, you know, like I, I'm, I cuss, you know, mm. like they're all talking about their, 
their heart chakras being open. <laughs> you know, when they're talking about lotus flowers. I'm like, you need to bring your ass to class. Like, you need to, you know, like, you need to quit whining, you know, like right. things like that. And I was like, teacher training had no idea what to do with me. And, and, but I was just like being who I was because the yoga was like making me like comfortable in my own skin. I felt, felt good who I was. I wasn't ashamed of being who I was. I remember having this thought that I was like, I'm going to teach people in treatment center. There was this thought I was going to do this. And I had a bunch of connections just because of the amount of meetings and people that I knew. And I started teaching at a men's program. And literally every single person that I taught in the, the men's treatment center was all about yoga by the time I got done with it. Oh, yeah. They were literally all about it. Like they couldn't wait for me to show up the next week. And it was like 12 guys that were like convicted felons who got DUIs, who, you know, maybe it hurt someone with a car. It was like a program that was specific to like that type of person. And I, uh, I like literally, they were so resistant the first week that I was there. But then after like the 12 weeks, they like couldn't wait to do it. And so I went to every single treatment center and I was like, I'm going to teach yoga. I would be like, I'm in recovery. I'm going to teach them yoga. You don't have to pay me anything. I had another job at this point. All of a sudden I was teaching at every single treatment center. So many people were getting stuff out of it. Uh, like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I found my group of people that I'm supposed to teach to, like the people just like myself. And then eventually, like, uh, you know, I got opportunity to teach like normal classes and I wasn't going to change who I was. Like, I was okay with like getting flack about not being like the average yoga person, you know, like I was, I've always been an outsider, you know, I've been yeah. a black sheep, you know, like I just recently did like my Enneagram thing. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but I'm an eight and like, it makes sense. I'm a challenger. You know, like I'm black sheep, like I'm okay with all of that. And so in the yoga community, I'm that as well. So it's like, I would go, I would teach these yoga classes and people would come expecting like this teacher would have like this flowery language. You know, this is like really when I found like myself and I found like my passion and purpose and all this stuff, I was like, I need to be purely myself because that is not what is being represented in the yoga community. And there was like sort of like this coming to God moment in, in all of the yoga community where it was like, it wasn't real. And that happened in like 2010. And I like to think that I was actually part of it because it was like, I was just speaking like my truth. It was like, we need to stop talking about like all of these things that are just made up. And we actually need to talk about the things that the yoga practice is giving us. And that's a completely different focus. And that's how I shifted. And as soon as I started really getting on a roll with that in the classes that were local in Columbus, that's when I knew that all of a sudden, like I was going to be teaching, you know, internationally and teaching workshops and things like that. Because like my voice just kept on getting stronger and stronger and stronger. I wasn't saying anything revolutionary. I was just being like, I was being me. And I think a lot of times, like we put on the mat, we, you know, it doesn't matter if we're an accountant, we put on the accountant mask, you know, like if we're, you know, like a yoga teacher, we put on the yoga teacher mask. And I was like, I'm not putting on a mask anymore. I did that with my addiction. I'm not doing it anymore. It's like, you can like me or you can not like me. I don't care. <laughs> it's like, and that's when it really shifted. Let me ask you a couple of questions. I have two questions pertaining to that. So very often kind of people who are game changers, you know, whatever we want to call them, like, you know, black sheep, we can use this term when they start gaining a following or people, they start getting attention, the community that they're within can often try and suppress them, shut them down, diminish them. Did you experience that at all? I, I mean, I, I experience it today, you know, like every day. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they want to shut me up because I don't speak how they, they speak, okay. you know, so I'm on the outside of, you know, even in the Shtanga community, which I'm pretty decently regarded because I'm the black sheep and I'm willing to say things that other yoga teachers are not willing to say. And then also the addiction thing in my past, um, of course. Yeah. I mean, I think like about a month ago, uh, people were trying to cancel me because I was saying that the fundamentalist of Ashtanga yoga, like the fundamentalist. And I said, I actually did a Twitter post and said, defund the Ashtanga police. And the Shtanga police are these fundamental people in the community that look to other people and say that they're doing it wrong. I said that we should defund those people. Mm -hmm. And so like people didn't like the thing that I used to fund and people didn't like the fact that I was talking to this imaginary group and it's actually a group of people. And the people that attacked me, the people that are trying to cancel me were all people 
that are part of the Shanga police. And so I, I face this all the time because I'm not afraid to say what I'm, what I want to say. Like I had friends that uh, are no longer friends now. Thank you very much for showing me that you weren't a friend to begin with. That's not what friendship is. Would you mind if I reflect something there? My belief is that in, in any pursuit, creative, sports, business, like whatever it is, there's only so much uh, real estate. And so it's just like on the planet, there's only so much real estate. Within a city, there's so much, so much real estate. When you are a gatekeeper and you have all the real estate, you don't want to give up any real estate unless people are, are, are kissing the ring. Often people who are black sheep or people who are doing different things, game changers, they won't kiss the ring. And then the people who are the gatekeepers who hold all the real estate, they want to shut you down. They, they want to make you a renter. They don't want you to own any of the landscape. And it's a real interesting thing because I see it play out from different kinds of social settings uh, all over the place. And it leads me to my second question that I had, because you'd said, I don't care. Um, but like, you know, you criticize me, da, 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 I don't care. And I don't want to suggest that you actually do care. But whenever I hear someone say, I don't care, but it's like their, their peers and people within their community who are pushing on them, I find it rare that people actually don't care. They, they'd like to not care. And let me ask you, do you actually not care? Or would you like to not care? Or is it some kind of hazy mix between the two? No, I actually don't care. And the, and the reason why is because the people that were giving me a hard time, they didn't matter. It's not that they didn't have value or they weren't good people or any of that stuff, but they didn't matter to me. And the people that I was speaking to that, that actually mattered, they didn't care that I said that. So if anything, what, what that was making me realize is that that was a more on brand comment than ever. I need to be more like that. And the reason why is because you start realizing who your people are. Because I don't care if like someone over the internet doesn't like me. That has no bearing. You know, like if I offended a student that, you know, that all of a sudden doesn't want to show up at my studio anymore because I said defund the Ashtanga police, um, <laughs> like I would that would bother me. It would <laughs> of course. Me. Of course. Yeah. But someone who I don't actually know and, mm -hmm. and who has never like been a part of our community or any of that kind of stuff doesn't bother me at all. The people that cared didn't matter and the people that mattered didn't care. And it was like one of those moments where I was like, this is exactly who I'm supposed to be. Well, the reason I'm asking is I often find whenever someone strays from the path, they unintentionally invite you know, the people who want them to stay on the path, like criticize them, berate them, push them down, all that kind of stuff. I'm always fascinated about the mental fortitude it takes to keep going. So whether someone cares, like, oh, I do care what people think, but I'm going to keep going anyways. Or if people actually don't care or if it's some kind of hazy thing, I always, I'm always interested in the mental process. I felt comfortable on my own skin, you know? And when you feel comfortable in your own skin and you're not like, uh, you know, the yoga's done amazing things for me. I have self-esteem, I have mm -hmm. confidence. You know, like I'm, I'm okay with the person that I am. I'm okay that I'm not for everyone. You know, I'm okay that I'm not liked by everyone, you know, and that's like a revolutionary thing where everyone wants to be liked by every single person. And that doesn't even make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. There's a bunch of people in my life that, you know, that I like, and there's other people in my life that I'm like, eh, you know, yeah. not my person. And it's like, if I'm not your person, I don't care if I'm not your person. The yoga community can be a little bit, uh, I don't even know the right word for it, but all of a sudden, like they like to turn on people. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that's like any community of practice. So musicians can be like that people from any kind of like, it's kind of culture where you folk, you have a group focus on doing some activity. And that's really why I'm asking you this. Cause I see it again and again, and people who are game changers and who kind of create a certain discipline that's all their own. They often have a story that's somewhat similar to yours. And I'm fascinated by the mental fortitude it takes to take that leap and still follow your own path. That leads us to you today. Tell us about your book away from darkness. Yeah. I mean, we released it, um, you know, me and my team, we released it, um, in February of 2016. This past year, I released the audio book for it. So it's a, nice. it's way behind schedule, but I never, I never really wanted to do it, but it was my quarantine project. But you know, for a time there, it was like an Amazon. I remember like Amazon, it wasn't like a top seller or anything, but it was like, it wasn't the book of the week, but it was like, 
they would show the trend. They would send me the emails. It was self-published, but through Amazon. It was like the hot book of the month or something like that uh, because of the amount of pages that were being read. But it was a really vulnerable account of my life. You know, it's 314 pages of like exactly who I am and like what I experienced and the good and the bad. And first part of it is very difficult to read. You know, like when I was doing audio book of it, it was one of the most difficult things that, you know, just to read it again. Like I thought I had processed all of the things that, you know, I had dealt with. I realized that I still need to process some stuff. Even just reading out loud, like I got, you know, there's several moments where there was like little tear jerkers. It feels like a different person's life. But when I read it and when I'm, I get to talk about it and, you know, share stuff like what I'm doing today, it feels real. I can still feel like the feelings of like, not wanting to be here and putting the needles in my arms and like, you know, the, the sickness of laying in my, my cot, you know, like strapped down to my bed. I can still feel all of that stuff. Releasing the book has like provided me uh, a lifestyle that, you know, is unbelievable. I get to travel. I get to travel around. I don't have to travel. I get to travel around and I get to talk about addiction. I've talked about it in many countries. You know, I get to help other people, like get them into sobriety. You know, I get to share my story. I get to talk about something, you know, that people don't want to talk about. Like no one wants to talk about addiction. I mean, if anything, they barely want to talk to a therapist about their addiction. You know, people don't even want to go to 12 step meetings to talk about their own, you know, addiction. Like, let's be real. But I get to go around and like shine some light on it. And that feels beautiful to me. That feels like what my life is supposed to be like. And so the book is like, give me the opportunity to share who I am and like what I've been through. but. It's given me this opportunity to go around and teach people. And that's unbelievable. Well, and, and tell us about the foundation. Yeah. Well, uh, the foundation is called the Trini Foundation. Mm -hmm. The simplest way to explain it is that it's a 501c3 charity. We basically raise money. I mean, since inception, I think that we have raised several hundreds of thousands of dollars. We have had uh, many people in scholarships in, in different countries, a lot in the United States and Canada. We have taught, uh, I mean, thousands in treatment centers. You know, we have a bunch of teachers that support us going into treatment centers that we pay them to go in and teach. We have a bunch of partner studios around the world that, um, you know, basically are able to accept funds from us so that we can pay for people's passes. They basically align themselves with us. They post us on social media so they can kind of get the word out. And then if someone in their network of people is struggling with addiction, they apply for a scholarship and we pay for their, their yoga pass. Because really the people, I was lucky, uh, but the people in addiction, I mean, most of the time they don't have any money. You know, they've, they've, they've wasted all the, all of their money. So like a yoga pass is like way down on the priority list. You know, that's one of the services that we're doing. And when we're also looking at other ways to sort of branch out and to provide other services um, going forward here in the next couple of years. So much of your story to me is kind of the person who found their way through the woods that they weren't supposed to enter in the first place. You know, like you came into something and you just said, I was really given this gift of being introduced. You know, I had this great experience of, you know, your higher power brought you into it, but kind of like, you know, you didn't fit the role. There weren't a lot of other men involved at the time, especially back then there was not like yoga involved in recovery. So you were in the woods that you were never supposed to enter, but then you've emerged with this incredible ability to help other people. What would you share with other people who maybe want to like give back or get to a place where they're able to like, to have more agency in their own lives, but also be able to help others. What can you share with people? Well, I mean, first off, if you're compelled to do it, then I would say that you need to do it. And you need to figure out the best way to serve whatever population you're talking about, whether it's addiction or, or any other um, community. Recently, I've had a lot of people um, struggling with uh, like eating disorders that have been reaching out or people that want to support other people and with uh, eating disorders and, and going into clinics and stuff like that. They've been really interested in sort of taking those classes into their yoga classes and different things. And I would say like the first thing that you need to figure out is like, you know, who are the people that you're going to help? Because if you can't figure out who you're going to help, you can't help everyone. You know, so it's like if you're going to help homeless, like go help the homeless and like have that be the focus of what, you know, what you're doing. The, the other thing, too, is like you're looking for authenticity. The cool thing about like what I have going on is I'm an addict as well. Like I can relate to the people, you know, so sometimes what I would say is like the addict is the best person to go help other addicts, you know, mm -hmm. so if they're going to pull them in. 
look at where you've been and what you've done, you know, with your life, the struggles that you've had. Is it domestic violence? You know, is it sexual abuse or trauma or stuff like that? Like, go help that population, you know, because there's a direct connection between like you understanding what that person is going through and also like that you can help them. And so that's a, I think that's one of the best ways to, to sort of approach it. But if you feel compelled to do it, you got to just do it. Because what I've realized from my own story is in order for me to get better, I had to keep on giving it away. I mean, I had to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the reason why is because I needed to keep on giving it away. I needed to keep on getting better. And uh, the only way that I could keep the things and the blessings that I've gotten is by keep on giving it away. And I think that if, if a lot of us approach life like that, you know, instead of like hoarding these things that we think are so important, it's like, give them away. No one, I've read a quote one time. It's like, I think it said something like, no one has ever gotten poor by giving away their wealth or something like that. And it wasn't talking about money. It was really talking about like, you know, just like giving away like the skills that they learn or giving away like the knowledge that they've required over many years and those kind of things. And it's like, that's what we're trying to do. And as a society, like we would be in such a better place if all of a sudden like we would show up at, you know, the homeless shelters more often. You know, like one of the biggest blessings of my life is that I've got to go and travel to India several times, but that's not the blessing. The blessing is that my kids have gotten to help other kids that were in orphanages there to see my kids interact with kids in orphanages there gave new meaning to how good their life was and also how to be of service to another person. And that is freaking awesome. You know, and if we wouldn't have been able to have those experiences, I mean, if I wouldn't have got sober, if I wouldn't have done yoga, if I wouldn't be giving back, you know, being selfish in your life is it's never a good tactic. Everything you said there just very, very much resonates with me. So we got three questions for you as we're closing off. All right. The first is 1% theory, 99% practice, 1% theory. How do you apply that to uh, the Trinity Foundation and your own life? Well, I mean, with everything, I think it's about action. First off, that's not my quote. Um, you know, like 99% uh, practice and 1% theory is a Patabi Joyce quote, which is the founder of Ashtanga Yoga. Most powerful thing about that is really that it's it's about walking the walk instead of talking the talk, you know, or talking the walk. You know, it's like it's literally about doing instead of like thinking about it. And that's sort of what that quote sort of embodies for one percent, but also embodies for my life. You know, talk is cheap, Taylor. It's like get to work. If you're gonna help someone, go help someone. You know, if you're going to make a living for your family, like go make a living for your family. If you're going to say you're going to do something, actually do it. Live in integrity. Those are important things. And so like, yeah, that quote means a lot to me. But what it really means is that I'm willing to forget about talking about it. And I'm, I'm interested in only really doing the action of, of taking care of it. And that, that applies in my practice, my personal life, and my businesses, all of that kind of stuff. I love that. All right. So uh, I always like to do a top three question. And when I say a top three, it doesn't have to be top three of all time. You're never going to change your answers. Just top three right now, front of mind. If you're going to think about what you've learned about yourself in the past 14 months over this pandemic, what are three things that you've learned about yourself? Three things that I've learned about myself is that um, I really like travel. Travel means a lot to me, even though that I'm a homebody. The other thing that I've learned is that uh, my family is extremely important to me. And I actually cherish all of the time that I have, even though that we've been down each other's throats because we've been so close, uh, <laughs> you know, like in, you know, like in one room. Uh, totally. homeschooling, that's really important. And then uh, the last but not least is that uh, I'm still a work in progress. The yoga is still working. I still need to go to my therapy. I still need to process my stuff. I'm not perfect. You know, I'm okay with not being perfect. And like what the pandemic has shown me is that uh, I still have work to do. The yoga, you know, the yoga, I still need to continue to show up. I haven't arrived anywhere. You know, like I, I have to continue to do the work. And w what I started realizing, you know, really quick, maybe in June of last year, is that it was bringing out a lot of anxiety for me and things that I thought I had dealt with that all of a sudden like came right back up because of, I guess, fear and, and anxiety. 
I realized that really on that the value of, of the pandemic is really that it brought me face to face with like, you still have to do the work, Kayla. No one can do it for you. Oh yeah, man. That's amazing. All right. So last question, do you have anything you want to leave with us? So our audience is like a huge mix of people from like the music scene, the punk scene, the business world artists. We have all sorts of people that listen to us. The reason we bring in people who I believe are just inspirational leaders, like people who show real leadership, you know, in, in all sorts of different parts of our world is that I don't care if you're from the corporate world or if you're from the punk scene or if you're an artist, I think that everyone has something to learn from everyone. So anything that you can share with us, with the audience, that you'd like to leave us with to chew on. Yeah. I, am I allowed to curse? Oh, curse away, man. Do whatever the fuck you want and whatever makes you happy. Because if you don't do what makes you happy, then you're not going to be happy. And that is, that is literally all on you. A lot of times we care about what other people think about us and it has no bearing on our pocketbooks, has no bearing on us at all. And so it's like, you might as well just do what you want to do and fuck everyone else (laughs) seriously do you everyone else can go somewhere else well said man well thank you so much for being here uh like words straight from the heart i felt it and you know the thing i gotta tell people is like nobody's gonna live your life for you but people will be more than happy for your life to be lived for them so make sure that you're happy all right thanks everyone and thank you so much taylor for joining us and spencer drop the beat Damn, that was a great conversation. And thank you so much, Taylor, for joining us. You know, listening to a story like that, I'm always reminded of how important it is to have confidence in your vision. And that's not like arrogance, because it's a totally different thing. Arrogance takes, it takes away from you, it takes away from other people. Confidence gives, it gives to you, it gives to other people. You know, Taylor has so much confidence in the value that he can bring to people's lives and the change that he can help bring into people's worlds. And that's real. And that confidence has not just changed his life, it's changed the lives of other people. If we can just tap into that value, really see what's within us that's gonna help the world, and then just sit in that power, that's when we can start making real change. So the thing I gotta ask everybody, if there's something you wanna do, if there's a change you wanna make, if there's someone you wanna help, go for it. Take the leap, make the things happen. You're not gonna do it perfect. You know, the first time that I did this podcast or the first time that I did anything that was outside of my comfort zone or was new, I didn't do it perfect. You get better at it over time. So when you're thinking about that next thing that you want to do, that's going to be transformative for yourself or others, you don't got to be perfect, but you got to start. As we're closing off, I want to remind everyone that we're produced and edited by Spencer Priest recorded by Patrick McKechnie and designed by Tammy Levy. I will see you all next time on One Step Beyond. One Step Beyond.